trust that you've uh, been uh, spending time in the Word and growing close to God through these um, strange times. Uh, our Bible studies are continuing and uh, various ministries are continuing, so don't feel that there's no opportunity to get involved. Uh, many of the uh, gatherings are occurring by uh, Zoom um, and as you might recall we've commenced a new monthly prayer meeting and we did the first of those uh, a month ago and it was great. It was just a really good time together. So I'd encourage everyone to participate in the next one which is tomorrow night. Um, so you just simply need to be able to click in through Zoom and uh, join together with your fellow believers in praying to the Lord. And uh, the Zoom link is, I think, in the news sheet today and we'll send another email out tomorrow just to confirm things. Uh, but please be encouraged to keep participating uh, and connecting in the small groups. We have a number of other things that are in your news sheet, so that's been emailed around uh, and uh, a few hard copies here. I think I did see something about a camp happening next week, is that right, for um, 15 to 17 year olds? It's a sort of a, it's a leadership sort of thing or just a general, general fellowship sort of camp. So, yeah, pray for that. Pray for the ongoing camp program because of its uh, impact. Uh, it's such a fantastic ministry and in these times it's hard to keep going, but uh, by God's grace we continue to do that. Uh, and keep praying for all the different ministries that are occurring. Hands and Feet continues to go on, uh, growing slowly, um, food distribution happening on a steadily increasing basis. So it's a great opportunity for us uh, as a church to minister practically to people. But let's join together now in a moment of prayer as we seek to seek the Lord's blessing on our gathering together. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together in your name. Thank you for the opportunity to be together in this place. Thank you that for those who can't be here, we can still connect. And Father, the beauty of our common calling is the name of Jesus. Thank you that we can know him personally. And thank you that through his work on the cross, we are made right with you. Lord, your call on our lives is to surrender and we pray for the courage and the strength and the uh, willingness to do that. Father, the drag of sin uh, in our hearts is debilitating and sin ultimately kills. So help us in our understanding of our need to surrender to you. Thank you that through grace we are washed clean and we are made alive. We once were dead in our sins, but you gave us life. And through that life, we then have hope. And through hope, we will one day see Jesus in all his glory. And so as we come together, give us the assurance of these promises. May your Holy Spirit sink them deep into our hearts so that we can go on day by day uh, through all these troubled times through this broken world and yet still have hope for the future. And we thank you that you have created that pathway of hope through into Jesus and through him, through into heaven. So, Lord, uplift us, we pray. We confess our wrongdoing and our sin to you and we ask that you cleanse us. We claim the promise that you will and we pray, Lord, that then you will continue to sanctify us, to make us clean, to make us holy, to help us grow and become more like Christ, for that is our call in this life. Help us then, Father, in our personal mission to those around us in spreading the gospel and being a light into this dark world and being salt into a world without hope. And we pray, Father, that as we do so, the good news about Christ, the wonderful gospel, will become more widely known. We thank you for the blessings that we enjoy together as family. Thank you for one another. Thank you for all here. Thank you for those who are listening. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bind us together in deep bonds of fellowship that are long-lasting 
that are encouraging, that are life-changing. And that in doing so, we will exhibit the love of Christ. He commanded us to love one another. And by doing so, all people will know that we are Christ's disciples. So let, us be, let, let that be the hallmark of the way that we live. And we pray for humility and the grace to do that. Bless the ministries that we have, Father. And we pray that these will continue to be uh, ways in which your name can be honoured. We pray in this coming week for the O'Donoghue family uh, with the funeral of Ben's grandmother on Tuesday. Um, we pray that you will give them strength and endurance uh, as they go through this time. We pray, Father, for uh, Nancy's brother uh, who has been unwell, that uh, you will continue to give healing to him. We pray for all those among us who grieving and suffering in different ways that they will call upon your name and that the comfort you promise will be given and so father as we gather together today and at this point to uh, hear your word preached we ask that you open our hearts and our ears and our minds to receive the word uh, as it is preached and so we pray for ben as he ministers to us we pray for the kids church and oasis as they uh, hear your word also that it be a time of rich learning and growth. And so we give you thanks, Father, for all these things now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a note that uh, Sophia McCrindle, who spoke to us here a few weeks ago, I suppose about a month and a half, maybe something like that, maybe even two months, I don't know, time goes by, uh, doing some, uh, some work locally. Um, we're going to be supporting her uh, based in the, uh, the work that she talked to us about. Um, the McCrindles have been a couple that we've been associated with on and off over the years, and so um, that's another uh, contribution. We, we contribute regularly to half a dozen or so different people involved in mission work, and uh, that's a wonderful thing for us to be able to do. So... Be encouraged. We'll look forward to hearing further updates in time from Sophia. Um, and a thank you to those who have um, supported uh, uh, our family in um, just doing some work with uh, Ben. Uh, it's been profitable to date, and uh, we look forward to continuing that for some for a time. Um, just to uh, uh, look to opportunities for the church and for Ben's ministry uh, to continue growing and going forward. So thank you for that. I'm going to do a Bible reading now, so I imagine it's time for Kids Church and Oasis Reloaded, and uh, trust that the uh, time you have together is uh, fun and full of good learning. We're going to read today from Hebrews chapter 13. This is the, uh, I think, third sermon in uh, this last chapter of Hebrews, a great chapter of a great book. Um, we're looking at the references to leadership today. So Hebrews 13, we're going to read from verse 7 onwards down to verse 19. And then Ben will come and preach to us. So Hebrews 13, verse 7, I'm reading in the ESV. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then let us continually offer up 
a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honourably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this, in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. This is the word of the Lord. So, Ben, forward to your message to us on considering leaders. Good morning to everybody. We have prayed a number of times already this morning, but we can never be accused of praying too much, can we? So let's pray again um, as we commit this message to, into the Lord's hands. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are a God who speaks. I pray that we would today and every day be a people who listen. Lord, speak to us your truth and may we receive it joyfully. Lord, may we come into your presence with the full confidence and assurance of faith. And Lord, we ask that we would worship you acceptably and with reverence and with great awe, knowing the completeness of your glory and the abundance of your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are very close, aren't we, to finishing our journey through the book of Hebrews. Um, just a couple of messages to go. Um, I want to give a public thank you uh, to our brother Tim uh, for stepping in at very short notice last Sunday. He covered last Sunday's preaching. Um, it was a great blessing to me um, as I was with family following the passing of my grandmother, Sybil. We called her Swibby. Um, I've really appreciated the prayers. I felt very uplifted from the prayers of a number of you um, as I prepare to take the funeral this coming Tuesday. Uh, she really was quite an amazing woman in so many ways. It wasn't just family who thought that, everyone who knew her thought so. Uh, she was a perseverer. Uh, she was 99 and three quarters when she died. So close, just a couple of months from reaching that 100. Um, She'd been living independently, in good health, until relatively recently. Um, I put this down to a couple of things. She swam. She was a swimmer. She swam regularly well into her 90s. She was a social butterfly. She always ate well, cooking for herself and for the, any number of visitors who often dropped by. She kept up with the latest technology. She had all of the kitchen gadgets that you could imagine. And I'm not sure how many other 99-year-olds were as active on Facebook as Squibby was. <laughs> and she kept herself physically, mentally, and socially sharp and healthy, which really kept her going and persevering. But I'm going to save the eulogising, of course, for now. She's obviously on my heart and mind, but so is the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to segue from my grandmother's perseverance, her physical perseverance, and what I'm going to do is pick up on the theme of spiritual perseverance, because unsurprisingly, this is one of the foundational concerns of God's word. Yes, physical health and eating well is of some value, the Bible says as much, but a primary and eternal value is our ongoing spiritual health. We, will we persevere with Jesus into eternity? And this has been an ongoing theme, hasn't it, as we've made our way through Hebrews. We've seen this a number of times. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read a number of verses that we have seen as we've made our way through Hebrews and just let these sort of wash over you and pick up the, the, that common thread of perseverance that runs through this book. Therefore, 
we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Hebrews 2 verse 1. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our hope. Hebrews 3 verse 6. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Therefore, while the promise of entering God's rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Hebrews 4 verse 1. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that none may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Hebrews 4.11 Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4.16 We desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's Hebrews 6, 11 to 12. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, Hebrews 10, 23. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, or your, which, which gives you great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised, Hebrews 10, 35 to 36. So you can see again and again the writer of Hebrews is clearly concerned for the church. He's concerned that there are some at least who are in danger of drifting from Jesus, from turning aside from the truth, from turning their back on the gospel. Now he is confident that those who live by faith will stay the course, but this does not stop him from giving several warnings about the dangerous consequences of hardening your heart toward Jesus. And you get this sense as we come to the end of Hebrews, as we come to the end of this chapter, you get this sense that he's really thinking, he has a real burden for what's going to happen to this church into the future. Who is going to spur this church on to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, to keep them running the race of the faith? And the significant part of his answer, as we're going to see in this final chapter, is he sees that leaders are going to play a key role in keeping this church on track. Now, he hasn't mentioned leaders specifically all through the book of Hebrews up until this point, and now three times in Hebrews 13, he mentions the leaders. And so from this, we can see quite clearly, can't we, that there are leaders in this church. And we can see that not only are there leaders there, but that the writer of Hebrews is thankful that there are leaders and he wants to strengthen the relationship between the leaders and the church. And so as he's coming to the end of this letter and his words are coming to the end, he hopes and prays that he's going to be able to be with them again. He asks the church to pray for that specifically in verses 18 and 19. But he's thinking for now... Who is going to keep things going? Who's going to speak the truth? Who's going to hold forth the gospel? And he turns to the leaders of the church. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews is effectively saying to the church at this point, he's saying, if you are going to keep going in the Christian life, if you are going to persevere with Jesus, if you're not going to shrink back from following him, then you're going to need God's help. You're going to need the help that God himself provides. And one of the ways that God helps the church persevere in faith is to raise up and to equip faithful leaders to teach the church and to guide the church and to shepherd the flock. And so this is going to be our focus together this morning. We're going to consider leaders. We're going to consider the place and the role of godly leaders in the church. Now, in many ways, this is a message for the elders, for the church elders. So it's very much a message to me as I preach it. But, of course, it's a message for the whole church, isn't it? Leaders need to be aware of their role and their responsibilities that we have under God. And the wider church, likewise, need to be aware of God's design. We all need to know what leaders are called to so that we can be mutually accountable to one another. Now, yes, it is true 
that all of us are called to encourage each other and to spur one another on. Hebrews 10.24 made that clear for us. But God has designed for the church to have leaders who are given to watch over the whole. So let's look at our passage. And we see that there are two blocks here, two blocks of three verses each, that speak to the leaders of the church. And they bookend the rest of the passage, which we're going to look at, Lord willing, next Sunday. So let's start with me. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. And here we read this. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So this is a call really to think about your past leaders. Think about those who established you in the faith. And we see three imperatives here. Remember, consider, imitate. So remember those who opened up God's word for you. Those who reinforced the gospel truth with you. Consider the way that they lived. The spiritual fruit that they produced. And imitate them. Follow their example. Live by the same faith. So I wonder, can you think... I I trust that you can. Can you think of leaders, people who have been this kind of leader in your own life? Can you think of those who taught the word faithfully to you, who set a godly and faithful example for you to follow? I can think of a number of people who have been that for me. So when I first became a Christian and and came to this church back in the Belrose days, it was was Eric Reid. I think we remember him, such a powerful preacher and a rock-solid man of God. And I remember just being in awe of this man. And his presence, his godly presence. Of course, over the years, I I see Graham Marlin as as a brother and and I count him a friend. And he's been such a ready example of humble and faithful leaderships. And even though he's no longer an official elder of the church, I think we all know that he's an emeritus leader for us all, isn't he? And these are people who can say, I believe, with the Apostle Paul, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. But it doesn't just have to be older people, does it? I think of those who had a massive impact leading me as a young Christian. Scott McLean. A number of us know Scott. He was our young life leader when I was in senior school. When I think back back to it, he's not that much older than us. But he led a group and it included me and it included Robin and Vicky and Bruce. People might remember Chris Corfew and others might know Tim Smithies, who's now on the executive at Covenant Christian School. There's been so much lasting fruit just from this group. Or I think, and I've mentioned him before, Steve McKerney, such a, such a significant um, task taking Robin and, and me under his wing. He spent months and months working with us, discipling us, opening God's word for us. The Apostle Paul says, doesn't he? He says to young Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in your speech, your conduct, your love, faith and purity. So Timothy, he was young, But he was set apart as a leader. And so the call for him was to set an example, to watch his life and his doctrine closely so that others could follow him. So again, this is God's design for the church, that there be leaders who are set apart to teach the word faithfully and to set an example for the wider church family. Now, if you look through the Bible, the New Testament particularly, for descriptions of leaders, what you're going to find is that church leaders, the New Testament calls them elders, Shepherd pastors, overseers, they're all the one and the same. And they're called, among other things, to be above reproach. Faithful, respectable, self-controlled, gentle, hospitable, not lovers of money. You can read the lists in places like 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 or 1 Peter 5. Now, there is a sense, isn't there, in which all of these qualities ought to be characteristic of every believer. But leaders are called to set an example in these things. Now, here, don't hear me saying that leaders are always better at these things than others. God knows that's not true in my case. I know that Brad and Peter aren't claiming that either. But there is a sense, isn't there, and we're going to see this later on, that leaders bear more responsibility for these things. And there needs to be a level of integrity such that others can see it and they can follow it. And when we stumble, and all of us stumble, are the leaders setting an example of what it means to acknowledge our weaknesses and our dependence on our Lord and our readiness to repent. You see, leaders can't just point people down the path and say, go that way. They need to be walking that path. 
blazing that trail so that others are encouraged to follow. Now, there is one characteristic that sets a church leader apart, an elder apart, which is not necessarily expected of every believer, and that is being able to teach the word of God. Now, all of us, of course, are called to grow in our understanding of God's word, but God sets some apart and gifts them to be teachers and preachers of the word, and that is a key distinctive of of a leader. They are those who speak the word of God to you, as Hebrews 3 verse 7 says. They are those who keep the faithful exposition of the Bible as central and foundational to the life of the church. Now again, all of us ought to be building up one another with God's word. All of us can be doing that. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? To, and I know a number of you do this, to meet up with others, open up the Bible and read it together and pray it through and discuss it with a friend. All of us can be sending encouraging verses to someone else or we can speak the truth of God's word into someone else's life. But, it, but we need to see, and I can't make the full argument here, but the passage points to it. The primary means that God has designed for his word to be proclaimed and for the building up of the church is through the faithful preaching of his appointed leaders in the church. And so the challenge, I think, for every Christian who is running the race of faith is to make sure that they are sitting underneath the faithful preaching of the Bible, that they're at a church where the whole counsel of God is rightly handled and taught. Now, if you're questioning the importance of this, then you don't have to look far, do you, to find churches where the word of God just isn't preached faithfully at all. And you see the consequences of this as poorly fed congregations are so easily led astray. This is what's implied by verse 9 in our passage. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 9. After speaking of remembering our leaders, verse 9 says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. And that was a problem back in the first century. It's been a problem all through history, and it's a problem for us today. There are all kinds of weird and wacky teachings that have absolutely no biblical basis whatsoever, and so many get carried away by it. Now, there are examples of this everywhere. Now, just this week, I heard a clip Uh, from a pastor and this pastor just took a verse out of Isaiah 43 it's probably irrelevant where he took it from and in this verse God says forget the former things do not dwell on the past see I am doing a new thing and from that this preacher went on to effectively say to his church God is speaking to me today and he's saying I'm going to do a new thing in this church God is telling us to forget the old way of doing church. He's saying, I am doing a new thing here. And then he went on to talk about how God was giving this church new and miraculous power to do amazing new things. And of course, it was all really exciting and there were lots of applause and cheering and amen from the congregation. And everyone was just getting carried away by it all. But at no point was there ever any mention or explanation of what God was actually saying in Isaiah 43. He was just taking this verse completely out of context and running with it as a basis for his strange and unbiblical teachings. And so this is where the church needs to be discerning. As a church, we need to hold our leaders accountable. Just because someone is a leader in a church, that doesn't mean that they are automatically approved by God and someone we should follow. And there are warnings, aren't there, all through the Bible to watch out for false prophets and false teachers, for wolves in sheep's clothing. So listen to the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. And from verse 28, he says this. Speaking to the elders, he says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So straight up there, you see, don't you? It's another clear scripture on the importance of leaders, the elders in the church. They're appointed by God. The Holy Spirit has set them aside as overseers and shepherds. And then he says this in verse 29, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them, so be on your guard. Now, it's a significant warning, isn't it? 
significant warning to leaders, it's a significant warning to the church. We need to be careful. We need to be discerning. And I would hope, I certainly would hope and expect that you would hold me and each of the elders accountable, that you wouldn't just thoughtlessly and blindly accept everything that we teach and preach, but that you would be like the Bereans, diligently checking everything that is taught with what the Bible says. And this is really, this is why for the most part we as a church preach expositionally through God's word. We make our way through passages and verses and books of the Bible because we want to get a strong sense of what God is saying, not just what we might want to say on any particular given Sunday. Now, how are you going to recognise false teaching? There are, there are lots of ways, but one of the clearest ways that we can discern false teaching is by recognising that it downplays or even casts aside the grace of God. Now, this is obviously a significant issue for the early church and the church that Hebrews was written to, who were tempted to go back to the ways of the law and the works-based religion of temple Judaism. But again, it's been the same all the way through history. The grace of the gospel of Jesus is a unique message. And whenever grace is set aside, you now have a totally different message that is not the gospel at all. It all becomes about you. And your goodness and your power and your prosperity and your faith. So when the focus moves away from the supremacy and the glory of Jesus and it moves away from our desperate weakness, our desperate unworthiness, and it becomes all about us and what we can do over and above what Jesus has already and completely and fully done, then at that point you have set aside the grace of God. Look again at Hebrews 13 verse 9. This is the warning. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. So this verse is saying, don't look to be strengthened by religious practices, be strengthened by grace. Listen to Jesus when he says to you, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Now, I love how John Piper describes this. This is, where, this is when he says this. He says, if you wake up in the morning and you feel guilty because of something ugly that you did yesterday, or you feel like a failure because of how poorly something went yesterday, what do you do? The strange teaching might say, eat a good breakfast. Get the right nutrition pumping through your blood. Do some exercise and get out into the sunlight. Now, all of these are good things. But God says over and above that, he says, get your heart strengthened by grace. On a morning like that, and I love the way he puts this, eat grace for breakfast. We need to be a church that eats grace, don't we? That feeds of grace. And we sang that hymn, only by grace can we enter only by grace can we stand not by our human endeavor but by the blood of the lamb we need to be strengthened by grace and we need leaders who preach grace and we do this by pointing you again and again and again to jesus and all that he is and all that he has done this is the point of verse 8 isn't it really verse 8 is sandwiched between the verses we've already looked at and it says this and what a glorious and foundational truth for us to hold on to today and every day. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Jesus never changes. Do you hear that? He never changes. He is always the same, and his message is always the same, and his grace is always the same, and the gospel is always the same. There is not a new teaching. God is not doing a new and novel thing in the church other than making new creations and new people from the same gospel grace that has been there from the beginning. The hymn chorus is spot on, isn't it? I love to tell the old, old story. It will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. The old story is the same. So here's the call. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you because the message hasn't changed. 
The leaders you follow today and tomorrow and through the rest of your lives will speak, Lord willing, the same message because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Now, this is the glorious Jesus that we're going to be focusing on in verses 12 to 16, which will be our passage for next week. But look ahead with me now to verse 17. Verse 17 speaks again of the leaders in the church. And it says this. Church, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Are you able to put... Oh, Mark's gone from there. That, that verse can go up on the screen if someone could, 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 could put that button to it. Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, it's one thing, isn't it, to remember your leaders, to consider your leaders, and even, even imitate your leaders, but it's another thing entirely, isn't it, to obey them, and submit to them. When you hear those words, just our defences sort of rise, don't they? It's not a popular concept in our day, in our, in our age of hyper-autonomous culture. It gets its bristles up when it, at any mention of having to obey and submit to authority. Now, we know, of course, that there can be abuses of authority. We need to be wary of this. But the Bible is clear that when you have godly leaders, faithful leaders, then they are a gift for the good of the church. So what is the motivation for both leaders to lead and for the church to obey? Now, just, just to point out that word obey there, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a common usage of that word throughout the New Testament. It has the sense here of being convinced by or having confidence in your leaders. So, so it's you, you are trusting your leaders and you're responding appropriately. This is picked up in the most recent NIV translation, maybe you've got that in front of you, which says here, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. That's really the, the idea here. So what is God's design? We get a sense, I think, in this verse of the mutual responsibility as we look to this verse, verse 17 as a whole. This verse speaks to both leaders and the wider congregation and it gives us all the insight in what leaders are called to do. So again, what is the God-given purpose of leadership in the church? Now, one of the key words, I think, in this verse is right at the end there where it says, see that word advantage? It's in the negative form there. So the verse is saying that if the wider church makes things unpleasant for the elders, if they oppose the elders and undermine the elders and make the elders' job unnecessarily difficult, if they make the elders lead with groaning and not joy, then this would be of no advantage to the church family. This would be of no benefit. Literally, this would be unprofitable for the church. And so from this... We can say that the God-given purpose for having leaders in the church is for the benefit, for the advantage, for the profit of the people. It is an advantage for the church to have godly leaders in place. Elders are not to be about enhancing their own position or increasing their own status or imposing their own authority. Elders exist not for their own advantage but for the benefit and the profit of and the advantage of the church family. Now, that's the most foundational point that we can take from this verse. But let's be more specific. How do leaders particularly benefit the people of the church? What is their particular focus? And we see it there in, on the second line there on your screens, that second part of the verse. Now, if you have your NIV in front of you, it simply says that they keep watch over you. But the phrase there is literally, as we can see, they are keeping watch over your souls. I think that, that acknowledgement that it's soul watching is so significant. This is the heart of the church leader's role. They are put in place to watch over the souls of the people. The primary concern of the shepherd elder in any church should be how they can best be a benefit to the souls of their particular flock. Now, by souls, we're talking here, aren't we? We're talking about that part of us that continues 
into eternity when our natural body dies and decays. And the Bible is clear. Your soul will either go to be with the presence of your Lord Jesus when, you, when your days here are done, or if you turn away from Jesus, then you are going to find your soul forever in the fires of hell. Paul in Philippians 1, he speaks of his desire to depart and to be with Jesus, which is better by far. And then Jesus speaks again and again to the soul that rejects him and says that they will spend eternity in utter torment. See, these, these are the stakes that we're talking about here. This is the stakes of watching over people's souls. Now remember, as we saw from the outset, the heartbeat of Hebrews is that the church keeps on running, that it keeps living by faith. Look back a couple of chapters, if you have your Bibles open, to the end of Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 and verse 39, the last verse there, says of the church that we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Now, this really captures, doesn't it, for us, the, the life of the church and the focus of the leaders of the church. Leaders are all about keeping watch over the flock, keeping watch over the souls of the people so that they are not those who shrink back from following Jesus, but who run forward in faith, keeping their eyes fixed on Jesus so that they are saved. The phrase here is literally that the true church are those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. So the soul is mentioned again there in that verse. So again, this is all about our spiritual perseverance. Now we tend, don't we, we when we think about salvation, I think we tend to think about salvation as a once-off thing that happened when we first believed. Now, that is true. That is wonderfully true, isn't it? You are wonderfully saved by faith when you genuinely first believe. But the Bible also speaks and often speaks about salvation in ongoing terms and in future terms. So God's people are those who were saved and are being saved and will ultimately be gloriously and completely saved. This is, this is the truth of God's word. God means to keep his people saved. And these means are the gifts of his ongoing grace in our lives. His mercies are new every morning for his people. Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. Do you remember that repeated phrase from back in Hebrews 3 and 4? We need this voice every day, don't we? We need to hear God's voice every day so that our hearts remain soft to God. Now, don't hear me saying at this point that you can somehow lose your salvation. If you belong to Jesus, then you are his for eternity. Nothing will be able to snatch you from his hand. But if you are saved, then God will continue to use his means to keep you saved, to preserve your soul. He will keep speaking his voice into you through his precious word. He will keep giving you sufficient grace and mercy with each new day, and he will keep your heart soft for him. And this is where leaders play their God giving role in the perseverance of God's people. They are those who speak God's word to you week after week after week. And God uses your leaders to keep watch over your soul as they keep pointing you to Jesus. Now, I see this as my most important part of my role as a preaching elder in this church, that I would keep feeding you with grace week after week, that I would be counted as a leader who spoke to you the word of God, just as Hebrews 3, 7, 13, 7 says. That's how I want to be remembered. This is the legacy that I want to leave for whoever comes after me as a leader here, that I would present myself... To God as one approved, a worker and a leader who does not need to be ashamed and who rightly and correctly handles the word of truth. So again, we need to understand, don't we, the Christian life is more than a once-off decision for Jesus. It's not just a one-time thing. We know, don't we? It's a, it's a lifetime battle. It's a lifetime battle against temptation and against unbelief. Why else do we gather week after week after week if not to keep pointing each other to Jesus and spurring one another on as we run the race and as we fight the faith, the fight, the fight of faith. 
It's because we know, don't we? We know we're so prone to wander from the truth. We are so easily distracted from Jesus. We are so readily drifting away. We stop relying on the grace of God and we turn to our self-righteous and independent ways. We forget to be strengthened by grace. We try to live by our own strength. And so we need God-given means to keep bringing us back on track. And there are lots of means, of course, that God uses. Prayer, communion, fellowship, and he uses leaders. Leaders to faithfully speak the gospel truth and to watch over the souls of those in the church. Okay, so I I think I've made the main point from this passage regarding leaders in the church, but there's just one more observation to point out from this verse, Hebrews 13, 17, and I think this just helps to fill things out as we finish up. Now, understand this, brothers and sisters. Understand that there is a seriousness and a joyfulness in the Christian life. Both are brought together, aren't they, in Jesus? And if the Christian life is characterised by a serious joyfulness or a joyful seriousness, then this is going to be typified, isn't it, in the church leaders. We get both of those together in this verse. The seriousness is found, isn't it, in understanding that one day all of us are going to have to, we're going to be called to give an account before God. But the Bible is clear. Leaders are going to bear more responsibility. And there are sobering verses in the Bible that are given especially to leaders and teachers and preachers. Now, the obvious one is James 3, verse 1, which says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And here in our Hebrews passage, it's clear, isn't it, that leaders watch over the souls of the church as those who will give an account for this ministry. Now, this is serious for me. And I trust that you take this seriously too. One day, I will stand before Almighty God and he's going to say to me, what did you do to watch over the souls of the people in your care, those who I placed under your care? What did you teach them? How did you live before them? What example did you set for them? And I will be called to account for this. And Peter will be called to account for this. And Brad and Graham, you've retired from eldership, but Graham will be called into account for this also. Eldership is a serious responsibility. And so if I'm going to be accused of being serious sometimes, then that's how it is. I don't think anyone's going to hold that against me 10,000 years from now. But it's a joyful seriousness, isn't it? And we get this charge to the people of the church to let the leaders lead with joy and not with groaning. And this is God's design for the church, that leaders would lead with joy and that the church would be blessed by this. Now, I I can honestly say this. I am so thankful for the love and for the encouragement and the prayers and the kindness and the generosity from my church family. I don't take this for granted. I know that I am far from perfect in my interactions with all of you, but I am thankful to God that I have far more reason far more reason to rejoice than to groan in my work for the church here. But let's all be praying for protection at this point. And we all know, don't we, we've seen it happen in so many places, how readily churches can be undermined and even destroyed by the arrogance of their leaders who fail to properly keep watch over the church in love, but also by congregations who stubbornly refuse to submit to their faithful leaders. And so, as the writer of Hebrews asks for prayer there, and you can see it at the end of the passage there in verses 18 and 19, I would ask you to pray for me and to pray for Peter and to pray for Brad and all the elders. Pray for those who are leading Kids Church. Pray for those who are leading Oasis. Pray for those who are leading home groups. We all need prayer, don't we? Let's not neglect to come before God's throne of grace with confidence to find help in our time of need each and every day for these things. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is clear. We can read it. We can know your truth. We can know who you are. We can know who we are before you, desperate 
and in need of forgiveness. And we can know your grace. We can see your plan of salvation. I pray that as a church, we would hold fast to your grace, that we would feed off your grace. And I pray for myself, I pray for my fellow elders, and I pray for those who would, by your design and in your plan and by your appointment, become leaders of your church into the future. Lord, that you would strengthen not only our faithfulness, but the, the faithfulness of the whole church as we hold one another mutually accountable for the full benefit and profit of your people. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you.